Welcome to Deconstructive Criticism, uh, Peter Sjöstedt Hughes, right? Uh, yeah, or P the English version is Peter Sjöstedt H, because uh, English people can't say Sjöstedt, as I pronounce it. So it's Sjöstedt H, and Hughes is just too long with Sjöstedt, really. So, um, right. Peter Sjöstedt H. Yes, it's, it's quite pretty, and uh, I've... Um, uh, I've got in touch with you because you've written. I actually got tipped off from uh, several uh, several acquaintances about your book because you've written a book called Numenotics. Yes. And it's an attempt at a new, uh, well, a vocabulary for discussing um, metaphysical psychedelic experiences. Is that correct? It's um, it's at the beginning of such a talk. Yes, that's the aim, anyway, in part. But it's really a collection of ten essays. Um, most of them do revolve around psychedelic philosophy, as you might call it, or psychedelic phenomenology. But there's also a few other things which are not related to psychedelics. So that's, for example, neo-nihilism and um, and some aspects of Nietzsche's and Schopenhauer's philosophy. Yes, uh, but uh, the reason I wanted to get in touch with you uh, from the start is because I think I read pretty much uh, everything that comes out in the hallucinogenic arena that can be called serious in any way, shape or form. Mm. And uh, previously in my life, that has been an easy task because, mm. you know, there's been almost no production. <laughs> yes, one, <laughs> once every five years or so. Yeah, yeah so, but uh, yeah, but it's starting to take off again. Yeah, I mean, it's um, exciting times, I think. I mean, we are now in, the, I don't know if you call it this in Sweden, but here we call it the second wave of psychedelia, psychedelia. So um, that's sort of spearheaded by the people who sort of run Breaking Convention in London and so on. But that's, you know, Europe, an American-wide phenomenon now. I think we've sort of moved away from the 60s to such an extent that we can sort of restart the whole thing. Um, yes, and it was in need of a reset because I think, the, personally, I think the hippie movement, the counterculture, the first wave or whatever you'd like to call it, uh, is uh, they uh, they really forgot about set and setting, and could probably have done with more elitism as well. <laughs> but that's my my point of view, and I want to talk to you about your point of view. And I'm sure we'll get into the neo nihilism uh, later on as well. But would you say that the second wave, as you call it, is a movement? Do you feel like you're part of the movement? Um, I no, because I, I don't really like. Um, I suppose that's a nature in me. I don't like to become part of any movement, um, and I do differ a lot from many other thinkers in the field. However, you know, there's enough overlap um, which sort of keeps me involved. So I'm, I'm sort of. Um, I don't know. I see myself as within the movement, but apart from it at the same time, because I don't. I mean, there's there's unfortunately a sort of a dogma emerging from this whole movement, and I'm I'm certainly against that. Um, and what do you say the dogma is? Well, the, I think this is actually, you know, a legacy of the 60s that there's a kind of um, kind of um, ethos which is akin to the New Age or to the certain aspects of the left, which psychedelic experience conduces by itself. And um, I think that's, I mean, historically not quite right and experientially not right. So that's why, for example, I, um, I wrote this um, popular article about the philosophers who had taken psychoactive substances, and some of those were of the right, you know, Ernst Jünger especially, uh, who was a friend of Hoffman's, for example. So, I, not that I'm, I, I try to stay apolitical as well as sorry. much as is possible. I'm sorry, could you just repeat that name, the friend of Hoffman, who was a, what you would, I, I, I presume, uh, call a conservative thinker? Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he, well, very, very conservative. Ernst Jünger. Oh, yeah, I've read him, The Psychonauts. Yeah, I mean, he coined it. Psychonautina in Swedish, um, yes. as it's I translated. Right, yeah, yeah. No, me too, because there, 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 is not an, there is no official English version, strangely, even though it was written in 1970. Although I do have... Yeah, no, it's very odd. So that's why I have the Swedish version and the German version. But um, I have actually got an English version translation, but it hasn't been published. Um, so that will be a big... A big one in the English market when that comes out. Yes, but please, uh, uh, if you'd go back to the the well, the leftist uh, experience uh, or nomenclature mm. that you're uh, trying to describe uh, the, the the thing. I, I mean, the loss of self, the loss of individuality mm. that is part of any hallucinogenic experience. 
uh, not, not any, but m most of them, yes. in, in a sense at least. Mm. Uh, uh, you would say that marries left, uh, marries well into a leftist ideology. I suppose it does because it's um, you know the the cliche, the platitude now is always you know loss of ego, and uh, yes. this is sort of a calling calling card for the whole movement in a way. Okay. But um, I I mean number one, I don't I think this is. People read about this, then they take psychedelics, and they then they'll say they they've experienced a loss of ego. I mean, I I've certainly experienced a sh what I call a shattering of the self, so that my self becomes you know um, multifaceted, and I'm not really and I can't. This is where language breaks down. I can't say I don't feel like I'm one person because I means one person, you know. But uh, for example, you get a sense of five identities or more, and so on. So that, in a sense, that's a loss of ego. There's also that even further. Um, notion that of being one with everything which is more of a kind of Schopenhauerian you know um, eternal now something like this yeah. but uh, Freud call it the oceanic yeah feeling. the oceanic feeling yeah which with Freud of course was very derogatory in in that you know saying it was um, a sort of um, a uh, backward movement into the embryonic form and that's how well, he tried try to explain mystical experiences but uh, we, we, we can uh, we can I think uh, well, uh, when I read Freud, and I, I, first of all, I think uh, I, I, I respectfully disagree on the breaking down of, of language because I think the shattering of the self formulation, uh, formulating it as a shattering of the self, I think mm. is uh, very accurate, a very good. <laughs> okay, well, uh, yeah, I s it myself, and when it comes to where Freud, I think, uh, uh, how would you looks down upon the oceanic feeling. Mm. Um, well, I think I think that comes from uh, you know uh, a fear of collectivism or uh, giving up of the self. Possibly, um, I mean I'm not really. I, I've, what was that? I think he's he wrote about the oceanic filling in. Was it the um, the future of an illusion? I can't quite remember the book, and I haven't read it for a few years. But I mean, of course, Freud does take a, a very um, atheistic view or materialistic yes. view. So it's a reduction of the mystical to that that metaphysic um, but anyway coming back to the main point I mean there's there's this common um, notion that yeah it's, uh, one one experiences ego loss and one becomes one with everything um, and of course in terms of politics that is uh, conducive to a sort of um, egalitarian socialist way of thinking you know to uh, the sort of loss of ego uh, we, we are all one and um, we should work together for the common good and so on you know very Swedish uh, ethos in fact um, but well, Sweden comes from a pagan, you know, history. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and yeah, I mean, well, I'm talking really about the sort of a 20th century social democrat um, um, imposition of egalitarianism. But so uh, am I. I'm sorry, uh, I, I can clarify. What I mean is that when socialism moved into Sweden back in the late 1800s to 1920s, 30s, when it really started to take root, uh, socialism married well, I think, into the Swedish culture because it already had an ethos of uh, mm. collectivism and consensus seeking, which is basically a, an earlier uh, version of political correctness before communism even was around. Right, yeah. Now, actually, I was reading something very, uh, which said, said the same thing. Um, Roland, Roland Huntford, what, I think it was called. Uh, have you read this book by Roland Huntford? It's called. Um, no. It's um, written in 1972 by a very Englishman. It's a very strong criticism of the Swedish system. It's called, um, what's it called again? Let me have a look here. Uh, like uh, the new, oh yeah, it's called the new, to the new totalitarianism. And it's uh, a sort I of... I haven't read it, but it sounds quite accurate. It sounds like he's captured it in, a, in the title. Yeah, I mean, he goes through the Swedish history and um, and he, he's very, very critical, you know, <laughs> very critical of Sweden. One party state, more or less, um, sort of um, the fusion of um, education with broadcasting and so on, uh, the sort of fusion of a collective ethos where individuality is, is um, looked down upon and so on. Um, it's just an interesting read. I mean, the book itself is from you can you can read it between the lines. It's from a sort of conservative Brit Englishman, so it's got its own biases. But nonetheless, I think it's a very nice objective look at Sweden. In fact, it's it sort of um, I sympathise with it very quickly because being sort of half Swedish and half English, 
um, the differences to me um, became very noticeable in Sweden compared to England. And I always thought it was quite strange when people said, you know, Sweden is the ultimate uh, European state, you know, the liberal state and so on. Um, when people had that stereotype, I thought it was quite odd because my experience of Sweden, although I love going to Sweden, I think it's a beautiful country, it's very authoritarian, you know, compared to England. It's very authoritarian, very homogenous in its thinking as well, you know. Whereas England allows for massive cognitive diversity without any kind of punishment, social punishment. Sweden, it seems people are, you know, very afraid to say anything which deviates from their norm. This is true and uh, um, makes it uh, quite an interesting country to be a comedian in, I'll tell you. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> Actually, I went to, um, last, last time I was in Sweden, I was speaking to a, a priest at a funeral and... Um, and it was very, very interesting speaking to him because, of course, you know, living in a social, you know, ultimately as well, social democrat, but sort of, you know, socialist, ultimately in its ethos, socialist country, being a priest is, um, you know, I suppose it's a bit, a bit like being a comedian, you know, people think, as, as, well, well, not the same, but I mean, you know, one is a minority there. One certainly is. Uh, I, I pref usually, when I explain to foreign colleagues uh, what it's like, I quote your own comedian Jimmy Carr. Uh, mm -hmm. Paraphrase, really. I say, doing comedy in Sweden is missionary work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what I, I mean, it's it's. I can imagine this because, of course, I suppose you're very. It's very. Um, you know, part of comedy is to say that which should not be said. But in Sweden, that comes with them. Um, you know transgression of law quite often I imagine so uh, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah now I feel sorry for you in many ways but at the same time you know I respect your well, um, bravery it's, there yeah, I, I imagine in certain respects it's, it must be much harder to be a comedian in a freer society mm. there are uh, less taboos around to break that's true yes um, I suppose it's got its positive and negatives well you tell me I mean well, I, I suppose you'd have to compare it to an it's hard work because they don't know how to laugh. But uh, but uh, if when it comes to finding taboos to break, well, in that case, I live in the country of abundance. Mm. Yeah. No. Well, you should exploit that, and I suppose you do. Yeah. Yes. I, do. I suppose that. Yeah. What, what do you mean, the audience? I can imagine the audience sort of thinking to themselves, "Should I laugh at this or not?" You know, <laughs> would that be wrong? Uh, I, usually, I usually, when people in Sweden talk about this, I'm, I try to explain to them, uh, joking about taboos in Sweden is, of course, taboo, but the the most significant taboo in Sweden is joking. Oh, yeah? And what, joking, what do you mean by that exactly? Joking, what I mean is, uh, are you familiar with the laws of Janta? Mm, not really, no. Uh, the laws of Jante are pan-Scandinavic, according to Axel Sandelmose, who was, a, uh, I think, a Dane or a Norwegian. He moved around Scandinavia to try and get away from, uh, well, I suppose, uh, unwritten social norms. Mm -hmm. uh, that if you break them, uh, stigmatize you and makes you a pariah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and he's tried to formulate these unwritten laws, and they're basically Ten Commandments. Uh, all along the lines of "Thou shalt not think that thou art better than us." Ah, mm. oh, that's interesting. I'd have to. Look, I'll have to look that up now after this conversation. Yes. The law number eight. Yeah. The eighth commandment of Yante is "Thou shalt not laugh at us." <laughs> mm. Well, that puts uh, you know. I can understand why you need to be a comedian in Sweden. You need to be an intellectual as well as you seem to be. Well, well, yes, and uh, that is how I found you. And and I and first uh, I must say, uh, whenever someone writes something in this field, I feel uh, revulsion, hate, and envy, uh, <laughs> because you know uh, one likes to be writes things oneself. If if one is one a comedian, one wants to be either a philosopher or a novelist or both, and then you fail because of ambivalence and you end up a comedian. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, you know. Yes, and and I'm not a philosopher, but I've tr I, I've tried to understand what you're getting at. First of all, of course, uh, philosophizing about psychedelic experience would need a, phenomen a phenomenology. Yeah. Yes. And I'm and so I was very interested, and I'm not sure I, I understood everything. So it's better if I let you explain in your own words what you try to do here. Okay. Well. Um 
I got into psychedelics very briefly. I got into psychedelics uh, not as a. I mean, I'm in my mid thirties now, and I I didn't really take psych. I did not take psychedelics in my twenties or before, obviously. Um, it's I came to it relatively late, and from a uh, you know from an academic angle, that's my excuse anyway. So I was teaching a bit of philosophy of religion in um, when I was a an A level philosophy teacher in London, and I had to teach arguments for God, the afterlife, and so on. Um, I was a sort of typical, you know, Dawkins atheist at the time. But anyway, there was this one argument, or rather reason, f for why people believed in um, a metaphysical realm. And that was the argument from experience, which I had never had. And it's not really a logical argument, it's, um, it's an experiential argument, so you can't use logic against it. Anyway, I got into, I got into reading William James's uh, great tome, The Varieties of Religious Experience. Um, wherein he writes that the mystical state begins um, with alcohol. You know, the, the consumption of al alcohol is the first minor step in the mystical consciousness. After that, he talks about ether, nitrous oxide, and so on. And so this, um, you know, I found this very, very interesting. I mean, my main interest in philosophy had always really mostly been the philosophy of mind, uh, consciousness. So um, I was very interested in these forms of altered states of uh, consciousness and then uh, um, one day I was I took a break from London went back to Cornwall where my um, family were based and um, I went for a walk with my brother in a field and he said oh look Peter I think there's um you know magic mushrooms I was like, okay really interesting right so I picked quite a few of them there's about a hundred there that day I never found so many ever again and uh, took them back to my home and identified them um, on the internet to make sure they were not, you know, poisonous or whatever. Uh, and they, they were, I realised, they're very distinctive, the Liberty Caps. And um, I dried them, took them back to London, and then I, I tried them. And, uh, it, I mean, it, it's absolutely f unbelievable, sublime experience that they offered. I mean, um, purely from a, even from a very materialistic atheist point of view, they immediately show you, give you this revelation, they tell you that, the human mind is so much more powerful than one could ever imagine. And I, I mean that literally. I mean, one cannot imagine what one sees on, with a large dose of psychedelia, psychedelics, rather. Um, so, I mean, I'm, to, I'm not just talking about pretty geometric patterns and colours. I mean, I'm talking about these incredibly exquisite spacecraft, um, which are sort of uh, flying about in their fantastic colorations and their um, p most beautiful bizarre compositions which you then sort of float into and um, you I mean I, I remember b being inside what seemed to be some spacecraft and seeing this cylinder in the middle and noticing that the detail around me was as intricate as anything I see in the real in this quote-unquote real world I think I've been there Peter yeah okay <laughs> well anyway um, yeah so well, I, I only say that because I think a lot of people don't realize what psychedelics can provide. I think a lot of people simply think, oh, you know, you see these geometrical patterns like you see in these 60s movies or something like that. You know, it's so much more than that. And not only visions, I mean, emotions as well. I mean, you know, I experienced emotions which um, for which there exists no words because it's not part of, um, every, you know, quote unquote again, normal consciousness. So anyway, so they gave me that and I realized that their field of application goes far beyond the philosophy of religion. I mean, it should really, one, one can apply this to phenomenology, for example, in philosophy and philosophy of mind generally and um, um, metaphysics, um, let alone, you know, more basic fields like um, philosophy of politics or something like that, you know, in terms of prohibition and the, the meaning of law and so on. So, so after taking them, I thought, all right, I'm going to have to read up about this, you know, like post-William James. I mean, William James wrote this at the end of the 19th century. And um, as you sort of intimated already, uh, there's not really much on it, you know, which I found bizarre because, especially in the philosophy of mind, that there's hardly anything on these peak uh, types of consciousness. I found bizarre. Uh, there is There are stuff like Lenny Gibson wrote something about Whitehead and LSD in the 1970s. McKenna, you know, wrote a lot, in, but he's not, a, you know, he's he's not a particularly. Um, um, a huge thinker. He, he, yeah, he's a bit like uh, he offers a number of great ideas to explore, but I don't think he's particularly. Um, 
you know, he's not a proper philosopher. <laughs> to, be, to sound a bit arrogant. But he doesn't. I, I don't think he even claims to be a philosopher. No, no, sure, sure, he doesn't. No, bot botanist. I think he calls himself. Uh, right. Ethnobot. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. I mean, yeah, I shouldn't be too harsh on him um, because no, no doubt he had a, you know, very. We have the same problem as Leary. You know, um, you, you you can use the substance for your own ends, or you can let the substance use you. Mm. Uh, I, uh, th that's the way I would formulate it. But as in, again, I'm not lost either. I'm there a right. Well, interesting you say that because there was, of course, a Swedish. Um, thinker called Patrick Lundboy or Lundborg for the English listeners and uh, I don't I, I suppose you've heard of him but he wrote um he died a few years ago but he wrote some some interesting ideas on philosophy and psychedelics and he said that coming back to your point here he says that um instead of um using a philosophical system to try to analyze the psychedelic experience one should invert that and use the psychedelic experience to sort of form a philosophy um yeah. I don't know if that's possible but it's an interesting idea I mean, well, he. I, I think I think it is. Can I ask you a, a, a few questions about your first psychedelic experience? Of course. Because uh, how you, how old were you? I suppose I was in my um, late twenties, early thirties. Can't quite remember. And you've been a seeking personality type, I suppose, your entire life. Say that again, sir. You've been a like a seeking. It doesn't mean you have to be new age or nothing. I'm just saying you're the type of person who tries to seek out new knowledge. You're curious. You're yeah. Looking around, you're trying to understand. So you collect a lot of insight and text and ideas and thoughts, feelings, right? Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I was known as the little philosopher as a child, so I suppose that's always been part of my character. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sounds like it. And mm -hmm. then you take this uh, substance. And you bring all these experiences with you. What I found when I took my first trip of LSD, I was 16, um, is that a lot of ideas and thoughts I've, I've been mulling around in my head and themes, they all seem to meld together and certain things just fell away and, and then the other things condensed into, uh, well, uh, short sen sentences that became, became quite meaningful mm. uh, to me. And apparently, when I told them to others, jokes. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Again, partly a Swedish thing, probably. But um, yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, William James actually writes about how a single sentence can um, trigger a mystical uh, experience, and he talks about I think the sentence that Luther gave, you know, about the uh, forgiveness of sins. When Luther heard the sentence, you know, um, "I forgive you of all your sins," suddenly he had this mystical. Uh, experience which then um, determined the rest of his his path of life but so, uh, but, but yeah no I, th I think I think um, if I understand you correct I mean what what they can do is they can um, swipe away all the sort of um, superfluous aspects of your life and make you focus on you know the in the important and interesting aspects of reality yes I think so if you have that in you to begin with that, and that's mm. my point about you you were called the little philosopher you're taking the substance and out comes something greater than a small philosopher. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, yeah, it's probably has it's an interesting, um, almost empirical question whether the same substances at the same dose can have radically different effects on different people. And I don't just mean effects after the experience, I mean during the experience. Um, some people seem to be not affected in the slightest. Uh, Baudelaire spoke about this as well. Uh, with regard to his sort of cannabis opium um, um, preference, you know that this re this kind of stuff is really for, you know, poets and artists and uh, thinkers and so on. Um, it will have much more much more effect in them than it will the general populace. And I think that might be correct if you look, because I've had, as you said, there's very little in philosophy, and there was even less in science when you tried to read up on mm. this being 16 and onwards. In my case. Mm. Uh, but I found uh, quite a deal in, well, you know, religion, mythology, anthropology. Yeah, I mean, that's... that's. And it seems every culture everywhere at every point in time has had a lot of restrictions concerning these substances. They've, they've known that it's usually for the priests or the shaman mm. and uh, not for everyone. 
Yes, and Ernst Jünger, in fact, um, you know, Albert Hoffman in his book, LSD, My Problem Child, Albert Hoffman, who created LSD, of course, he's got a chapter on Jünger, and he, and wherein he quotes Jünger as saying, uh, I don't think these drugs are for everyone, they shouldn't be handed out to everyone, you know, in contradistinction to Huxley. I don't think that's actually true of Huxley, Aldous Huxley, but that's what Jünger says anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, although I'm for the decriminalization of um, psychedelic substances, I still think that one shouldn't thereby treat them as like beers or, you know, some kind of some, some basic drug. I, th I think, you know, they, they it must be understood that they can, uh, they are potentially life-changing um, drugs. Not, not necessarily, I mean, usually in a positive way, but not necessarily. No, definitely not. And if you read, uh, like... Um Hell's Angels uh, by the Fear and Loathing guy. I Thompson. That, Thompson, yeah. Then you see that that when they give the LSD to the Hell's Angels, they react quite differently because they their childhoods weren't what you would s describe as optimal. Mm. Interesting. Or, I haven't read that actually. Yeah. No, but uh, and I, I I've see, and Watson takes the same stance, right? You have you read Watson? Yeah, I mean yeah. years ago. I mean that's one of yeah. the uh, few that you can read. Yeah, it's um, and also it's interesting that yeah that the literature on mystical experiences is quite large here, of course, in the West, and I, I suppose that's the closest as psychonauts as as Jünger calls us um, can you know can get until recently. And now there's been a flourishing of publications, of course, but actually still not so much in philosophy. It's more um, in terms of psychology and um, neuroscience and. Um, Usually, I mean, the second wave now of psychedelia is, has a massive focus on therapy. You know that um, psychedelics can be used as thera you know, as medicine, which I think is, you know, is, is probably right. And but again, it can not necessarily. And I think that I can understand why this um, emphasis has been made, and that is to uh, to change the common um, perception of psychedelics as something criminal. Um, into something medicinal. I can understand that, and thus one um, starts its uh, common acceptance. However, I think there's a danger in it as well, because although the, you know the effects of such um, intake may be uh, beneficial to a person, that's not the real value in it. You know, not for me anyway. Um, you know, the, it's a bit like saying. Um, you know, watching a movie can can have um, you watch going to the cinema once a week can have positive psychological benefits. Yeah, I'm sure it can. But the interesting thing about movies is not that those effects; it's the movie itself. You know, it's what you know the sort of um, acting and the cinematography and and so on. And it's the same for psychedelics. I think the real value in it is the experience itself, not its after effects. Uh, true, true enough. But one should also remember when they when they push on the medicinal value. I mean, it's. 10,000 years ago, uh, the person who administered the drug sometimes used it, used it for medicine and sometimes to you know, ju just converse with demons and God. Right. Well, yeah, uh, no doubt. I mean, it has, like I say, it has a therapeutic um, um, purpose, element. but it's uh, element. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's not um, it's not it's, uh, it's not its prime element. It's not its no. prime prime reason. Not for me. I mean, if I was suffering from um, something, I might take a different stance, but. You know, most so, people who take psychedelics, I don't think, are suffering from something. I'm, so, I'm sorry. What did you? What would you um, define its prime reason as? I don't think it has an intrinsic prime reason, but at least from my point of view, its its um, prime value lies in its um, it its being a tool for um, increasing consciousness. And um, a tool for exploring the mind, which seems to be, you know, one of the greatest challenges of this century. You know, the hard problem of consciousness: how mind and matter relate. How is it that a little bit of matter can have such a profound effect on the mind? We don't understand the the relationship between mind and matter yet, despite what a number of people say. There's all these num there's so many theories about it. So um, that mind itself can be increased to such a phenomenal degree. I think uh, really deserves much more attention than it has got recently. I remember, you know, um, Professor David Nutt, who was a. Uh, do you know this guy? He was. Um, I interviewed him for this podcast. 
and I listened to it. Yeah, <laughs> actually, yeah. Um, you know, he said when he did these recent trials in um, in uh, scans of uh, people taking LSD. I remember he said in this sort of after party of it um, a few days later in some interview. He said um, one of the one of the um, piece of knowledge he acquired from these tests is that if you want to understand consciousness, you've got to look at psychedelics. And I think, uh, you know, he's not a philosopher of mind, of course, but I think that's very true. I mean, you know, the potential here is profound and people just haven't haven't been um, open to the, this um, potential. I think that's um, partly because during the first wave of psychedelia in the 60s, in, in academic circles, um, the prevalent philosophers of mind then were very reductionist. So you've got, for example, behaviorism in the uh, or logical behaviorism, the philosophy of mind. So, you know, mental states don't really exist. They're just um, uh, words for expressing behavior. Like happiness isn't a mental state, really. It's smiling or jumping or whatever, laughing. And um, that was prevalent then. And also identity theory that, you know, the mind is identical to um, certain processes in the brain and so on. Both of those theories um, were well, are not believed anymore really because of uh, a number of logical contradictions that they um, lead to. So now you know um, there are a number of there's so many emerging uh, new theories of mind available, and that's the interesting thing now that there's a second there's a renaissance then in psychedelic uh, research which coincides with a much less reductionist view of um, the mind. So that's. That's why I think in the next 10, 10, 20 years or so on, there's going to be, there will hopefully be a massive um, flourishing of, of, um, of research into this. But then again, maybe not. I don't know. It's hard to predict. The pendulum might swing again. That was my biggest worry when I picked up uh, your book, that I was going to read another uh, hippie-like justification. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I was uh, disappointed and uh, gladdened. <laughs> but, uh, Disappointed but, in what sense? Yeah, uh, because, uh, and this brings us, well, first into Nietzsche, because you've written, uh, you accuse Nietzsche of being a drug fiend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, because, I, you know, as, as, an, as a 20-year-old philosophy undergraduate, I got into Nietzsche, as we all do, and, um, and, uh, I've always had this interest in Nietzsche, of course, and, and, and I got into psychedelia later than him, but then I uh, was quite interested. I mean, when you, you can, you know, Dionysus for Nietzsche, of course, is his, you know, I, he says, um, I am a disciple of the philosopher Dionysus in Nietzsche's later works, also begins his whole philosophical career and the birth of tragedy, of course. And Dionysus, of course, was the god of um, wine, intoxication and dance and so on. And uh, so there was that immediate connection but when I looked into his his work um, and his letters and so on I realized that and it, like his sister's biography of him I realized that he was yeah he was a massive user of opium and chloral hydrate and um, a number of other substances and um, interestingly Lou Salome his his love she wrote a book about him a biography of him she also became a lover of Freud later I say also she did, she wasn't actually a lover of Nietzsche, but um, she argued that a lot of his work was inspired by dreams, um, especially his main, you know, what he considered his main work. Thus spoke Zarathustra, and when you look at the letters, you realise he's taking large doses of opium um, whilst writing Zarathustra. So I'm talking sort of um, 1880, 82, 83, 84. And um, and of course, if you look into the literature of opium, we it's dreams that opium, the main psychedelic experiences in uh, from opium is through its dreams, as Thomas De Quincey wrote about in the Confessions of an Opium Eater. So it's quite plausible that you know that one of the main um, influences of Nietzsche's main work was provided by opium to a large extent. That's interesting. Would you say it's his main work, uh, Zarathustra? Um, I, it's not my favourite. I mean, he himself, in you know, in his autobiography, Eke Homo, says it's his um, masterwork. But I, it's not my favourite work of his, and I think it was quite noticeable when I read your book. It's Beyond Good and Evil, or Birth of Tragedy. Mm, 
I mean, I did teach Beyond Good and Evil for six years, so I've got a slight bias towards that and the <laughs> genealogy as well. I, I think, yeah. um, you know, that Zarathustra is his only work of fiction, as it were, and it's and it's and the style is completely different from all his other works. It's very yeah. poetic, of course. Um, yeah, some would, uh, when I was young and read Nietzsche, and I was very young when I was discovered Nietzsche, I read him uh, with... Uh, as a serious philosopher, and I really, you know, got into. I was uh, before I even knew what Ayn Rand was. I was almost an, uh, an objectivist <laughs> uh, before uh, I uh, uh, took LSD and realized, huh, that's wrong too. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, but uh, nowadays I read him almost solely as a comedian, actually uh, ranting about things. You can read him that way. I mean, you can read Schopenhauer certainly that way, especially when he writes about Hegel and so on. Um, yeah. But uh, the thing, you know, Nietzsche wrote to Salome, actually, in terms of style, one should um, get as close to poetry as possible without stepping over into it. And, you know, he's got all these uh, rules about style that one can read, um, which are very interesting. And, of course, he's known as one of the greatest of all German writers. Um, I still think, though, that some of his... Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I do take him, not all of his work, but mo a lot of his work is serious uh, philosophical work and psychological work. I think, though, that, you know, his main inspiration, Schopenhauer, was more of a sort of um, classic philosopher. I mean, he got more into the logic of things, more yeah. detailed analysis. Um, so... But you, did, you have, uh, obviously, a Nietzschean streak to your writing, because uh, I want to get into... Uh, the second part of your book now, Neo Nihilism. Mm. Uh, I can't disprove you, because, uh, but but I've always considered myself a classical cynic, more Diogenes um, mm -hmm. than than uh, a modern day uh, Soros or something, uh, like uh, you know a philosophical view on cynicism. Okay. Or, uh, yeah, the school of cynicism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm aware but of it. Yes. When I read you uh, and neo nihilism, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe there's some of me in this as well. <laughs> I think neo neo. Um, because uh, you start by this, you're using Hume, uh, Hume's gu guillotine mm. uh, uh, as a guillotine against pretty much everything. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, I take that from Hume. Of course, I don't go into Hume's own moral theory. Um, which is, um, you know, based on sentiment. But I, I extract that from Hume. I extract parts from Schopenhauer as well. Um, in order, I, I suppose in a way, it's trying to provide the logical foundations of uh, Nietzsche, you know, um, using philosophers, you know, using other philosophers in, in, in one sense. Um, I mean, that, that, um, that text is an anomaly for me, really, because not only... Um, well, it's using a, a different style of writing uh, for me, I'm using hyperbole, you know, which is sort of somewhat akin to Nietzsche's or sort of an attempt at that sort of style, but also using other people like Ragnar Redbeard and so on. And it is highly critical. Um, I'm trying to get to the essence of the logic behind Nietzsche, um, which are also inspired by a number of the meta-ethicists of the 20th century, so people like uh, C.L. Stevenson, uh, Mackey, um, Ayer to a certain extent. But I also provide a metaphysical foundation for the nihilism, which they don't have. So it's an anomaly in that sense. I mean, it's not really saying anything particularly new. I mean, the ultimate um, message of it is that there exists no absolute morals, no objective morality, which I think most people probably say, yeah, I agree with that. But when you really ask them about the fundamentals of it, they, they won't really. Um, so there's nothing new in that sense. The only new thing about it is the sort of uh, fusion of these um, of these uh, thoughts into in, and the expression of it. Yes, and this uh, got me thinking quite a lot because uh, Say this was turned into politics at one point or another. Mm. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had um, I, w I was interviewed by um, Dreamflesh recently, and he was he was um, drag he was pushing this. I mean, fundamentally, it's apolitical in the sense that, um, you know, often you say, well, if there's no, if you can't substantiate um, egalitarianism, for example, 
then that yeah. would lead to Nazism or something like this, right? But of course, Nazism itself is a moral, it's an ethic, it's a prescriptive ethic. So that is as unsubstantiatable as is um, its opposite. So it really, so it really, sorry, so it leaves you in a sort of, um, it's a, it, I suppose it's a sort of dark form of, leaves you in a dark existential, existential abyss in a positive way. <laughs> I, I don't know, but it also got me curious what would happen if you applied Hume's guillotine to uh, that position? Um, well, yeah, it's not you. It's not a prescriptive position, so you can't say one ought to be a neo-nihilist because that would be self-effacing, of course. But it's it's just a descript. You know, I make the distinction between prescriptive and descriptive morality in it, and it itself is a descriptive analysis not prescriptive if you used it for prescription then you'd sort of be uh, misusing it i understand but uh would you say then that it is an insight that you can carry with you but it shouldn't be practiced or uh, well the, the dangerous word there is should should shouldn't <laughs> um I sp the ultimate point of it is that it 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 tempts. It, it's it's a kind thing I'm doing in the sense that I'm em trying to emancipate people, free people, from any um, indoctrination they might have in terms of morality, which is always part of of politics or whatever. So yeah. it's a sort. Of, I mean, the real raison d'être of it is is to um, free one's mind to be open to completely new ideas, which normally you might people would just dismiss as obviously wrong or something like that. I mean, it's a, it's just. Um, yeah, it's just an emancipator, if anything else. I think, um, I think, uh, for someone brought up in Sweden, and I was, I did live there a few years. I mean, it's 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 more radical than it would be in England because, um, you know, as you know, egalitarianism has been a tenet of the social democrat state since I think 1969. Yeah. So it questions that. Um, as such, it's quite good, but what I want to know really is if you uh, relate this to postmodernism, how is it not culturally relativist? Culture, well, I suppose cultural relativism has a number of different meanings, but generally speaking, if one is a cultural relativist, one says often, not always, but often one says one shouldn't criticize other cultures because there's no right or wrong about it. But by, by saying that, by saying one ought not to, one already then brings in a prescription, which is um, can't be logically justified. So that in that sense, it's, it's not cultural relativism. I mean, many people, for example, say Sweden is a cultural relativist state, the epitome of it even. And it's neo-nihilism uh, is certainly not that. Well, uh, I really, really liked it. I want you to know that. And it got me thinking in quite a few ways, especially this year, because this podcast this year, uh, from New Year's and onwards, uh, Gregorian calendar, um, I've been, um, well, I'm uh, devoting the entire year to crushing socialism here in Sweden. <laughs> okay, good luck with that, yeah. You've Thank only you. got 100 years of a legacy behind you, but... I know, I know, but uh, one at a time is my motto. <laughs> I hope you know, that I will uh, uh, be able to interview you again for this podcast because both when it comes to uh, the second wave of hallucinogens and uh, drug research, I think we will have reason to talk to each other again. And uh, furthermore, I will be carrying some of the texts from your book, Nomenotics, within me for a long time. And I think I will have to return to them and probably call you again and question you. Yeah, it'd just be a pleasure. Yeah, great. Well, I'm, I'm really um, honored to be... Uh to have influenced, inspired you so much. So, thank you. Uh, no, it's um, it's my pleasure, sir. And uh, thank you for participating. It's really been uh, lovely, fun. Thank you. Thank you.